In contemporary times of consumerism and superficial commentary, philosophy seems like a dying art, which is why I'm excited to share an in-depth conversation I just had with Dr. Noam Chomsky. Philosopher, linguist, professor, political critic, and author of over 100 books. For the last 50 years, Dr. Chomsky has worked out of his MIT office, where I sat down with him, surrounded by large stacks of books, papers, and memorabilia he's collected over the years. And at 84 years old, Dr. Chomsky is as sharp as ever and was able to articulate his unique viewpoint on everything from media propaganda to the war on terror. So, without further ado, my one-on-one -on -one with Dr. Noam Chomsky. Thank you so much for taking the time to, to meet with me. It's a great honor to be sitting here. And we're in Boston, we're in Cambridge actually, but you know, as someone who was living in the aftermath of the Boston bombings, the chaos, what did you think of the police and media response to them? Well, the, I, I hate to second guess police tactics, but my impression was it was kind of overdone, that there didn't have to be that degree of militarization of the area. Maybe there did, maybe not. It's kind of striking that the suspect they were looking for was found by a civilian after they lifted the curfew. He just noticed some blood on the uh, street. You know. But I, I have nothing to say about police tactics. As far as the media was concerned, uh, it was 24-hour coverage on television, on all the channels. Uh. Also, just zeroing in on one tragedy whilst ignoring the tragedies incurred. Well, in fact, I, all across the Muslim world. Two, every two day. days after the uh, Boston bombing, there was a drone strike in Yemen, one of many. But this one we happen to know about because uh, the, a young man from the village that was hit uh, testified before the Senate a couple of days later and described it right at the same time. And what he said is. Uh, interesting and, and uh, relevant. He's, he said that his village uh, was an isolate. They were, they were trying to kill somebody in his village. They said the man was perfectly well known. They could have apprehended him if they wanted. Uh, he was uh, a, a drone strike is a terror weapon. We, we don't talk about it that way, but it is. Just imagine if uh, you're walking down the street and you don't know whether in five minutes, uh, uh, there's going to be a, an explosion across the street and from some place way up in the sky that you can't see, and uh, uh, somebody will be killed, and whoever else is around will be killed, and uh, uh, maybe you'll maybe you'll be injured if you're there. Uh, that's a, that just is a terror weapon. It terrorizes uh, villages, regions, huge areas. In fact, it's the ma most massive terror campaign going on by a long shot. And what happened in the village is that, according to the testimony, Senate testimony, that uh, he said that the jihadis had been trying for years to turn the villagers against the Americans and had not succeeded. He said in one drone strike, uh, they turned the entire village against the Americans. That's a you know, maybe a couple hundred new people who will call terrorists if they take revenge. It's a terror generating machine. It's a terror, it's a terrorist operation and a terrorist generating machine. So it goes on and on. That's not just the drone strikes, also the special forces and so on. Well, that was right at the time of the Boston Marathon and it's just one of innumerable cases. And it's, um, it is more than that. This, uh, the man who was the man who was targeted for whatever reason they had to target him. Uh, that's just, first of all, that's just murder. Uh, there are principles going back 800 years to Magna Carta uh, holding that people uh, uh, cannot be uh, punished by the state without being sentenced by a quite speedy trial of peers. That's only 800 years old. Uh, uh, they have various excuses, but I don't think they really apply. Uh, but beyond that, there are other cases where, which come to mind right away, or should, where a person is murdered who could easily be apprehended uh, with severe consequences. Uh, the most famous one is uh, uh, Bin Laden. Uh, 
he was, uh, there were 80 or so special forces, highly trained naval, Navy SEALs broke into his, invaded Pakistan, uh, broke into his uh, compound, uh, uh, killed a couple of people. Uh, they had captured him. He was defenseless. I think his wife was with him, but uh, and uh, under instructions, they just murdered him, threw his body into the uh, ocean. Well, without autopsy, uh, that that's only the beginning. The apprehension of Bin Laden and, and the assassination and, and dumping his body in the ocean, and of course, the narrative completely fell apart. Um, and also, you've, you've said that, you know, in the, in the aftermath of 9-11, when, when the Taliban said, we will give you bin Laden if, we, if you present us with evidence, which we didn't do. We didn't. Um, yeah, I mean, their proposal was a little vague. Sure. But you could have pursued it. But why are people so easy to accept conventional wisdom government narratives with virtually no all, questioning? That's all they hear. I mean, you hear a drumbeat of conventional uh, propaganda, in my view. And it takes a research project to find other things. And of course, at the same time as the Boston bombings, Iraq saw almost its deadliest week in five years. I mean, April was the deadliest month in, in a long time. Um, More atrocities time. going on every day, suicide bombings. Yet, seeing the zeroing in on this tragedy, when at the same time our foreign policy is, is causing this effects, uh, these effects in Iraq. Well, there is, uh... I mentioned Magna Carta, but, which is 800 years, but there's also uh, something else which is about 70 years. It's called the Nuremberg Tribunal, which is the foundation, it's part of the foundation of modern international law. And it uh, defines aggression as uh, the supreme international crime, uh, differing from other war crimes, in that it encompasses all of the evil that follows. Now, the U.S.-British invasion of Iraq was a textbook example of aggression, you know, not a question about it, which means that we're responsible for all the evil that follows, like the bombings. Serious conflict arose. It's now spread all over the region. In fact, the region is being torn to shreds by this conflict. Well, that's uh, part, of, um, part of the evil that follows. The media's lack of coverage with everything that you're speaking on, and, and I know that America runs on this nationalism and American exceptionalism, but is America's severe lack of empathy unique? Or, is, or do we see this in every country? And are we just growing up in America and we just, you know, are isolated with our own viewpoint? I think it's true of uh, every great power that I can think of. Britain was the same, France is the same, uh, Germany was. Unless a country is defeated, like when Germany was defeated after the Second World War, it uh, was compelled to pay attention to the atrocities that it had carried out. But others don't. In fact, there was an interesting case this morning, which was I was glad to see. In fact, it was finally uh, there are uh, trials going on in Guatemala for uh, of Rios Montt, who is basically responsible for the virtually genocidal destruction of the Mayans. And the U.S. was involved in it every step of the way. Finally, this morning, there's an article about it saying that something was missing from the trials, but the U.S. role, which is good. I'm glad to see the article. Of course, Reagan, the School of Americas. Do you think that we'll ever see white war criminals from, from imperialist nations stand trial in the same way Rios Montt did? It's almost impossible. Take a look at the ICC, International Criminal Court, black Africans or other people the West doesn't like. Uh, I mean, Bush and Blair ought to be right up there. There's no crime, recent crime, worse than the invasion of Iraq. Uh, Obama ought to be there for the terror war. But these, that's just inconceivable. In fact, there's legislation in the United States, which in Europe is called the Netherlands Invasion Act, a congressional legislation signed by the president uh, which authorizes the president to use force to rescue any American brought to The Hague for trial. I mean, you know, this is mind-boggling. You know, and, and I, speaking of, of the drone wars, I can't help but think of John Bellinger, the chief architect of the drone policy, who was speaking to a think tank recently, and he said, 
that Obama's ramped up the drone killings simply to avoid the bad press of Gitmo, of capturing suspects alive and trying them at Gitmo. When you hear things like this, what is your response to people who say his hands are tied, he wants to do well? Well, that, that's actually was pointed out some time ago by a Wall Street Journal military correspondent. What he pointed out is that Bush's technique was to uh, capture people and torture them. Uh, Obama's improved it. You just kill them and anybody else who's around. It's not that his hands are tied. He's a, I mean, that's a much more, uh, it's bad enough to capture them and torture them, but just uh, uh, murder on executive whim and as I say, it's not just murdering the suspect, it's a terror weapon, terrorizes everyone else. Right. So that's, it's not that anyone's hands are tied, that's what he wants to do. I'd rather be detained indefinitely than be blown up as well as my family and friends around me. Yeah, and, uh, and that terrorizes everyone else. And uh, there's, uh, uh, there are recent polls which uh, show that uh, of Arab public opinion, the results are kind of interesting. They, uh, they don't, uh, the Arabs don't particularly like Iran, but they don't regard it as a threat. It's ranked very low. They do see threats in Egypt and Iraq and Yemen. Uh, the United States is the major threat. Uh, Yemen, Israel, slightly above the U.S., but. Uh, basically, the U.S. regarded as a major threat. Well, why is that? Why would Egyptians, Iraqis, and Yemeni uh, regard the United States as the greatest threat they face? Well, it's worth knowing. Stick around. I'll have much more from my interview with Dr. Chomsky after the break. I want you to watch what we're about to do because you've never seen anything like this on television. Welcome back, guys. Here's the rest of my sit-down with Noam Chomsky. The controversial Obama policies, obviously, the National Defense Authorization Act, the NDA, which you're a plaintiff on the case. You've also said that Holder v. Humanitarian Law is actually worse, uh, you know, providing material support for terrorism. Do you think that both of these policies are just codifying practices that, are, that have already been in place for decades? The NDAA is pretty much codifying practices that have been employed. It was a little, it went a little beyond, and the court case, in fact, is narrow. It's about the part that went beyond uh, authorization to imprison American citizens indefinitely without trial. That's, uh, I mean, that's a radical violation of principles that go back, as I said, 800 years. I don't see, frankly, much difference between uh, imprisoning American citizens and imprisoning anyone else. They're all persons. But we make a distinction, and uh, that distinction was uh, ext extended by the NDAA. Uh, the uh, Humanitarian Law Project broke new ground. Um, there was a concept of material support for terrorism, already a sort of a dubious concept, because what's how do you decide what's terrorism? Well, that's an executive whim again. There's a terrorist list created by the executive branch without review, without uh, anyone uh, having any right to contest it. And if you look at that terrorist list, it's, it really tells you something. So for example, Nelson Mandela was on the terrorist list until three or four years ago. Now, the reason was that in 1988, when the Reagan administration was strongly supporting the apartheid regime in South Africa, in fact, uh, overruling congressional uh, legislation in order to aid it, they declared that the African National Congress uh, was one of the more notorious terrorist groups in the world. That's Mandela, that's 1988, mm -hmm. barely before apartheid finally collapsed. And he was just on the terrorist list until then. Uh, or to take another case, in uh, 1982, when Iraq invaded Iran, the U.S. was supporting Iraq and wanted to aid the Iraqi invasion. So Saddam Hussein was taken off the terrorist list. It's not a terrorist. 
we've got to give them aid. Right, it's, M-E-K? Hmm? Well, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's executive whim to begin with. We shouldn't take it seriously. But there was, putting that aside, material assistance meant, uh, you know, you give them a gun or something like that. Uh, under the Obama administration, it's uh, you give them advice. Well, let's talk about the linguistics and language of the war on terror. Uh, what did Obama's rebranding of Bush administration policies do to public consciousness? The, the policy of murdering people instead of capturing them and torturing them uh, can be presented to the public in a way that makes it look clean. It's presented, and I think most people see it this way, as a kind of a, a surgical strike which goes after people who are uh, planning to do us harm. And this is a very frightened country terrified country, has been for a long time. So if anybody's going to do us harm, it's fine for us to kill them. And some of the reactions are, how this is interpreted is quite interesting. For example, there was a, there was a case about a year or two ago when a drone attack in Yemen killed a couple of little girls. And uh, there was a discussion but with uh, a well-known a liberal columnist, Joe Klein, uh, I think he writes for Time, and he was asked what he thought about this, and he said something like, uh, uh, it's better that uh, four of them are killed than four of four little girls here. So because, I mean, the logic is mind-boggling, but if we have to kill people elsewhere who might conceivably uh, uh, have uh, aim to harm us, and it happens that a couple of little girls get killed too, that's fine. We're entitled to do that. I mean, suppose any other any country was doing that to us or to any anyone we regard as a human. It's uh, incredible. But, uh, this, this is very common. I remember once when, right after the invasion of Iraq, uh, the, uh, uh, Tom, Tom, Thomas Friedman, New York Times, a Middle East uh, specialist columnist was interviewed on the Charlie Rose show, you know, the sort of intellectual show on uh, the, this guy. And he, uh, Rose asked him uh, what we ought to be doing in Iraq. And I wish I could, uh, you got to see the actual words to grasp it, but basically what he was, what he said is something like this. He said, uh, American troops ought to smash in to houses in uh, Iraq uh, and make those people understand that we're not going to allow terrorism. And uh, uh, he said, kind of suck on this. We're not going to allow t terrorism in our society. You, got, you better understand it. So these uh, terrorized uh, women and children uh, in Basra and Baghdad uh, have to be uh, humiliated and degraded and frightened uh, so that because so that Osama bin Laden won't uh, attack us. I mean, it's mind-boggling. And that's the peak of uh, liberal intellectual uh, culture, supposedly. Right, and then you have famous atheists like Richard Dawkins saying that Islam, Islam is one of the greatest threats facing yeah. humanity. I mean, that's a whole other form of propaganda, the liberal well, elites perpetuating this, not I just mean, neocons you know, and Christianity warlocks. right now is a much greater threat. <laughs> well, the media, I want to talk to you about that because obviously that's instrumental in manufacturing consent for these policies. I mean, your book, Media Control, was written a decade before 9-11, yet it outlines exactly how sophisticated the propaganda model is. When you wrote that book, did you have any idea how far it would come, and where do you see it in 10 years? I'm afraid it didn't take any foresight, because it's been going on for a long time. I mean, take uh, the U.S. invasion of South Vietnam. Did you ever see that phrase in the media? I mean, we invaded South Vietnam. Uh, John F. Kennedy in 1962 uh, uh, authorized a, U a bombing of South Vietnam by the U.S. Air Force, uh, authorized napalm, uh, authorized chemical warfare to destroy crops, uh, uh, started driving uh, peasants into what were called strategic hamlets, basically concentration camps, where they were surrounded by barbed wire to 
protect them from the guerrillas who the government knew very well they were supporting. What would we call that if someone else did it? But it's now 50 years, over 50 years. I doubt that the phrase invasion of South Vietnam has ever appeared in the press. You can hardly, I think a totalitarian state would barely be able to achieve such conformity. In fact, probably wouldn't be able to. And this is at the critical dissident end, I'm not talking about the ones who said there was a noble cause and we were stabbed in the back, you know, which incidentally Obama now pretty much says. But it's become so sophisticated, and I don't know if it's just because I'm younger and I've seen it, you know, just in the last 10 years and in, in the post 9 11 world, the media sophistication. And, and, and my question is, you know, with the internet and the advancement of technology, do you see a reversal of this trend where more people are just going to be making this form of media and, and propaganda irrelevant? Or do you see a worsening? I mean, the, you know, the internet gives options, but options of which is good. It's good to have more options, but uh, the print media gave plenty of options. <laughs> you could read dissident journals if you wanted to. Uh, the internet means you can read them faster. Okay, that's good. But you know, if you think back, the I mean, the shift from uh, say the inv invention of the printing press it was a much greater step forward than the invention of the internet. That was a huge change. The internet is another change, smaller one. And it's, uh, it has multiple characteristics. So on the one hand, it does give access to a broader range of commentary and information. Uh, if you know what to look for, you have to know what to look for, however. Uh, on the other hand, it also provides a huge mass of material, which is, well, to put it politely, off the wall. You know? <laughs> and how is an, a person without background, framework, understanding, isolated, alone, sitting in his living room, how are you supposed to decide? Another form of propaganda is education. Uh, you've said that, you know, the more indoctrinated you are, I'm sorry, the more educated you are, uh, the more indoctrinated you are. And that propaganda is largely directed toward the privileged. How dangerous is it to have an elite ruling class with the illusion of knowledge perpetuating and ad advancing their own world view on humanity? And it's just this perpetual feedback loop of the ruling class. It's as old as the hills. <laughs> I mean, there have always been, the, every society has had some form of privileged elite who claim to be the repositories of uh, understanding and uh, knowledge uh, and uh, uh, want to control uh, what they call the rabble, make sure that they like the people who say, we want to be ruled by countrymen like ourselves, who know the people's sores, not by knights and gentlemen who do but oppress us. They don't want people to have thoughts like that. So therefore, there are uh, major propaganda systems. It's kind of striking that Propaganda is most developed and most sophisticated in the more free societies. Uh, the public relations industry, which is advertising industries, mostly propaganda, a lot of it commercial propaganda, but also you know, thought control. Uh, that developed in uh, Britain and the United States, two freest societies, and for a good reason. It was understood roughly a century ago that uh, people have won enough freedom so you just can't control them by force. Uh, you therefore have to control uh, beliefs and attitudes. It's the next best thing. It had always been done, but it took a kind of a quantum leap forward about a century ago with the development of these huge industries uh, devoted to, um, as their leaders put it, uh, the engineering of consent. If you read the founding documents of the PR industry by Edward Bernays. But he says, we have to make sure that the general public are incompetent. They're like children. Uh, if you let them run their own affairs, you have all kind of trouble. Uh, the world has to be run by the intelligent minority, that's us. And we therefore have to control, we have to regiment people's minds the way an army regiments its soldiers for their own good. 
just as you don't let a three-year-old run into the street, you can't let people run their own affairs. I mean, be, you get these countrymen like ourselves uh, who know the people's sores, you're going to be in real trouble. Uh, and, uh, and that's a standard idea. And it's taken one or another form over the centuries. But, uh, uh, and in the United States, it's institutionalized into major industries. None are so hopelessly enslaved than those who believe that they're free. I think that was Goethe who said that. Thank you so much, Dr. Chomsky. Amazing to sit in front of you and take the time to talk to you about all these things. I really appreciate it. Thanks. I really appreciate it.